Hey, I'm Michael. Welcome back to another video. I'm really excited about today's video because today it's my first interview and I'm going to speak to John Palmer from Invest for the Future. He's running his own YouTube channel already for more than two years and he's investing into the Australian share market for more than 25 years. So there's a lot to discover in that interview today and we focus a little bit on his investment strategy and how that the strategy has evolved over the last couple of years. So stay tuned and we are going right into the video. Third time lucky. Uh, John, welcome to my channel. How are you doing? I'm going well, Michael. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we um, we tried to uh, record that Zoom meeting already uh, two weeks ago. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Uh, and you should think that technology reasons should not be the case. But yeah, we made it. Um, so I'm really glad to have you on the channel. Uh, thanks for coming along. No, it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, technology. Uh, sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> Yeah. Today, hopefully, it's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Now we we made it work. That is great. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I I first think it would be great if you could uh, introduce a little bit yourself and and your YouTube channel, Invest for the Future. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. Like, look, I've uh, I'm retired now, but you know, I used to teach for forty five years and interested in maths and uh, investing. Had an investment property, sold that, bought our house, uh, and then once the children pretty much had left home and suddenly we were salary sacrificing into super. Then I started to generate a bit more of an interest in actually rather than throwing a dart at the, the ASX and uh, thinking, oh, that might be a nice stock. I'll buy that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I went and actually started looking at more fundamentals and, uh, uh, and yeah, so I've been uh, managing my super fund for 25 years, I think now, mid, mid nineties. So uh, slow, still slowly developing some sort of a strategy that. But that means you I made hope. all of the all of the waves from the stock market. Uh, you basically ride them uh, with your portfolio. So you you were invested oh, in the ups and downs of of the last decades. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I was invested during the dot com bubble and the and the GFC and actually the GFC uh, was a very good lesson. Huh. Like I tried to retire at the end of 2007 because I thought I had enough money um, yeah. and the, the GFC pretty much convinced me that, uh, yeah, I had enough money so long as nothing went wrong. <laughs> Fair <laughs> and, enough. And so um, I went back and worked uh, part-time basically yeah. at that 0.7 for, for five years. And I loved it actually. I don't, think, I don't think I really was ready to retire. It was just one of those times where you go, oh, man, wow, this is just driving me nuts uh there's got to be something better to do than this and uh um yeah it was one of those moments that uh probably uh the gsc was good for me because i went back and I enjoyed the five years and and yeah. now we've got enough uh in our super fund that there's lots and lots of, of cash on the side as the sort of the uh, insurance policy yeah absolutely and then i can be a little bit more aggressive uh, in my investing looking for growth rather than just sort of uh, boring old um, REITs and uh, high dividend, sorry, high dividend paying stocks uh, or, I think, or the like, yeah. I think that's really important, especially if so everyone, and we talk a little bit about that, about different investment strategies. No? And in your situation, it's, it's very important that you hold a lot of cash to be very sure that you don't have to draw down on your investment, right? Um, but before we get on that, um, uh, I'm, I'm really interested and I'm following your YouTube channel already for, for quite some time, uh, almost since the start, I would say. Um, yes. What... what <laughs> What was the the driver to to start a YouTube channel? And and obviously, I know you have your teaching background. Maybe it was that. Give us a bit of an idea on on why you started in the first place. Well, sort of a, a few reasons, I suppose. Um, there's always always the lure that you're going to become an awesome superstar, and, uh, and there'll be awesome amounts of AdSense revenue. And I did think about things like affiliate links and sponsorship deals and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was that was sort of part of it, but not yeah. much really. It was more a case of of uh, a couple of um, 
videos appeared on my feed. I don't know why they appeared, but basically came from, uh, at the time it was called uh, Aussie Wealth Creation, I think it was. And, yep. um, and then a young, uh, young lad, Hamish Hodder, uh, they appeared in my feed and I just watched a couple of their videos and I thought, wow, these guys uh, are very inexperienced <laughs> <laughs> and haven't seen all the, uh, the horrible things can actually happen in the market. And uh, I think, well, I reckon I can put some stuff up here and see whether people like it. And uh, it took, uh, so that was it really. But in the end, it really boiled down to being my, um, what you call it, the monitoring my approach that, that if I share openly what I'm doing because I try, try very much to be honest um occasionally a few fibs <laughs> might creep into your life every every now and then but uh but if i'm sort of sharing my journey i can't go up there and say that you know, this is my strategy uh and if it turns out to be bad i can then just go and lie about it so oh, 100%. Uh, so you know by putting it up there um it keeps me honest and also keeps me on track and uh, and I do enjoy the research. I do enjoy looking for patterns of historic performance. Yeah. And uh, I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah. so it's sort of a combination of things, really. But uh, but to be honest, right now it's a little bit frustrating. I'm putting a lot of a lot of time into um, you know three videos a week. I'm trying to do, and yeah. it's a stretch to be honest. Absolutely. So how these guys yeah. how these guys can put up one a day, I don't know. <laughs> and they and I, and I look at them and they you know they seem to be much uh, better quality than what I've been able to put together. Yeah. Uh, but it's take, it takes me like eight hours, I guess, to put together a video. By the time I've researched it and put all my spreadsheets together, and I'm looking at it and I'm doing well. I mean, you know, ten thousand odd subscribers, and you know, I'm making some nice little you know side money on the side but hey i would hate it to be my full-time job yeah but still <laughs> very, line. still very impressive and i i think uh, you're doing a really good job with creating your videos and and you shouldn't compare yourself with with people that potentially do that really full time which which obviously a lot of them are out there and they do nothing else that's their job no? and you retired and but it's still very impressive um, how you do that and i really like the approach that you take with with those videos so talking a little bit about the strategy um, and I, I probably combine two questions um, first it's a little bit around the general investing strategy how how did you find your strategy and if you could then pick a little bit on on one of one particular strategy that you that you um, talked about a lot in your videos is the the 2020 approach I really like that and I would love to share it with with my my viewers as well so if you could talk a little bit about that yeah sure um... Look, I, I used to watch um, Your Money, Your Call when it was on Sky Channel before it got taken off. And one guy that sort of resonated with me was a fellow called Roger Montgomery, who was speaking about, I, 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 probably, I guess he'd call himself a value investor. He tried to work out what the intrinsic value of a company might be and why would you want to pay a lot of money for something that isn't worth as much uh, as actually what the share price is saying it is. So a little bit like um, the Warren Buffett approach. That yeah, you yeah. Would see a lot on on YouTube now. Yeah, yeah. I think I think he basically is uh, would say that Buffett would have been one of his mentors. That, mm. uh, you know, he's based a lot on there. Um, so I eventually I bought his book, Value Not Able, and read it through, and then read it through again, and then he had some tables in there about uh, how you go about doing this uh, assessment of intrinsic value. Um, yeah. And, and he bases his a lot on uh, return on in uh, on return on equity, uh, and then uh, companies keeping a, a good proportion of their profits and then reinvesting it into the business. And then how do you estimate what sort of a return that might uh, give for the company? Yeah. And then he's got a, a whole a whole couple of tables there, and I sort of managed to work out what the mathematical formula was behind the table. So I was able to then program uh, my spreadsheet uh, to to calculate these intrinsic values automatically without having to get a bit of pen, <laughs> pen and paper out. Yeah. So I, I, I got a bit enthusiastic about it and started manually downloading all the data from Westpac. Um, so I ended, up, I ended up with about 700 
uh, stocks data uh, sheets, yeah. with all of the with all all the data in there, uh, copy and paste, copy and paste, um, and then applied the formulas, and I and I came up with you know all these intrinsic values that uh, these companies had, and and I, I had some good results from it, but but as a result of doing it, I, I suddenly started to see all of these companies. Uh, in the light of what was going on with their earnings and what was going on with their debt and their revenue and and all the all the things that I guess you know people who look at fundamental analysis and are way better at it than me would would do you know they get the balance sheet out and then go through it line by line and go oh I don't like the look of that or this is very good they're growing this and so from that um, I then started to get the idea that well hang on some of these companies that are doing really, really well all seem to have similar sorts of metrics. They all seem to be growing their earnings and many of them don't seem to have much debt on the balance sheet. So yeah. um, I, st- I started then um, once I joined Stock Doctor and could get at some really reliable data because manually putting it in there was just so t- time consuming. Um, so with Stock Doctor's database, I was then able to start running some scans. And it was, you know, from that that my, I guess, my investment strategy uh, was finally uh, locked in place. It's still it's still a, a thing in progress. It's not mm-hmm. like, wow, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. It's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be something that will continually change. And, you know, we might talk about that a bit later. But, um, yeah, so, you know, that's sort of pretty much the journey um and i still watch um lots and lots of youtube clips i uh uh and uh, i watch the the switzer one i like to hear what julia lee's got to say and some of the other guys that are on there and uh, then i'll just go and crank up the uh, balance sheet or from stock doctor and have a look at the companies and go Oh, okay. Yeah, that might be something to be considering. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's one of the the really good things. And that's that's um, obviously it's very hard to first identify something, right? Identify stock stocks companies that you think are really interesting and and probably where you have a bit of an idea of about what they are doing. Uh, but then obviously taking those informations really first and not acting on them immediately and just trusting what they say, but then doing that research afterwards, right? I think that's that's a very important point that you made. Um, and and you you touched on it a little bit with the, the back testing that you did, right? So um, yes. So you so if you first, first of all had all that data, right? And you updated that then every time when there was a reporting season or how often did you have to update your data? Yeah, I, I started with the, um, just sat down one day and said, right, okay, let's start at ABC. And uh, <laughs> I think Adelaide Brighton Cement might have been the first company and uh, away we went. And so, you know, copy and paste, copy, paste. Okay. Um, and to be honest, my brother, um, who's just a little bit of a, a, a computer nerd, he's not a big computer nerd, but yeah. he's, he's not too bad at, at doing some programming. And he wrote a macro for me that enabled me to copy and paste. And all I had to do was hit the little arrow that he put on the, the spreadsheet and it automatically took out of it all the data that I wanted oh, yeah. and transferred it over into another sheet on the spreadsheet. So uh, I ended up, as I said, bit by bit with about 700 companies uh, and that took, you know, several weeks, you know, sit down and because it's boring as heck, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just sitting there <laughs> with a mouse. Um, and, uh, yeah, so then I would update that um, annually. Uh, I did that for about three years, I guess. Yeah. Um, But you obviously and- moved on now. Oh. Uh, up now in, in in the way you do things you use now that that online platform stock doctor to get actually exactly the well, same yeah i mean I, I think i think you know it was a case of i was trying to do it as cheaply as possible mm. and then i had i had did have a brainstorm that if i could do that and then somehow morph it into something that i could then sell um then but then i could never work out how i was actually going to do that and stay ahead of the law in terms of copyright and yeah. anything else, so, oh, so I, I just pretty, I pretty much gave up on uh, on that, so that then, process. But it was, sorry, I was just going to say it was more a case of of time, and you know, uh, I was just weighing up how much am I actually paying myself 
uh, to be doing this and it was not much. Yeah. Uh, so I was said, well, okay, look, I've, I've got a, a good chunk of money now set up in our super fund. I can afford to pay the uh, annual subscription and that will give me the time then to rather than just be getting stuff and updating spreadsheet, actually doing research and, yeah, and actually think uh, about the different companies. Huh? Yeah. It's about, you know, using your time effectively, I guess. Well, I yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's right. Um, and and I just mentioned earlier, backtesting. You have a lot of videos where you do some backtesting on strategies, trying to figure out there are some some really interesting gains that companies made over the last year. Why was that? Um, and probably how are the companies set up and you compare them? No? And that's your, your earnings per share you mentioned uh, compared to net debt to equity. And you did a lot of backtesting on that. So, so what were the, the resu results of that um, in, in one, uh, I don't know, in, in one way? So you had... Tons of those videos for different companies, <laughs> but but what, is, what would be your yeah, yeah. your 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 yeah your feedback after uh, after doing all that backtesting? Yeah, well, I do I do like looking at individual companies and their their spreadsheets, and a lot of my videos you'll see uh, information that I ha have extracted from Stock Doctor. And to be fair, Stock Doctor and I have had a conversation yeah. uh, about what I can and can't do, uh, and there. I don't have a, a relationship with them at all, apart from the fact that if someone mentions my name, I get a, a deduction off of my next subscription. But um, in terms of, you know, me and the channel and, and Stock Doctor, there's nothing financial there. Um, but uh, I have agreed and they, they're happy for me to say, well, you, you can put some of the stuff up on the screen, provided you uh, reference us as the source yeah. of your data. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you look at those spreadsheets, there's lots of greens and oranges all over the, the spreadsheets, which are saying, look, I like that aspect of the, the financials and I do enjoy doing that, but that <laughs> is not the basis of how I invest. Um, I tend to look for groups of companies um, that fit particular sorts of metrics mm. uh, and as an entire group, how do they perform? Because I've got no idea whether, in fact, an individual company might do well in the future or not. Yep. So I don't think that's my strength. And, um, you know, there are certainly some, some people commenting on, on YouTube about individual stocks. And, and I think you might be in the, in the case of you look at a company's business, you look at their uh, future prospects, particularly probably in the IT area, because that's... Uh, that's where I'm coming butter. from, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you you have the knowledge in the background to understand the space. Uh, you know, if I was to go in and say, "What do you know, John, about uh, the IT sector?" and I go, "Not much. Uh, I use Excel and I use a computer." But if you were to line up a half a dozen companies that all look like they were sort of doing the same things, I think you would be able to say. Well, I really like that company over there and that one for these reasons. I wouldn't be able to give you a reason. Um, and so, therefore, I have to take a different approach, which is can I find a bundle of stocks that's not, you know, too many? I don't want, like, 100 of these things. Um, something that comes down to between sort of 10 or 20 uh, that I can say, right, I can invest in those and I'm expecting sometime in the next 6 to 12 months that one or two of these will actually become the flavour of the month uh, and they'll do very well. And I know that some of them won't do well yeah. because the, their metrics are temporary. They've done well for a short period of time and suddenly they will encounter some headwinds. And so I'm looking for these groups of stocks that historically, um, by fitting those metrics, have done very, very well. Yeah. And that negative 2020 so uh, the people on my channel get sick and tired of hearing about this you know uh, john you're talking about net debt to equity again what, what's going on it's you know as long as as long as i got more cash than debt i think that's what i'm i'm looking for safety in a company i, I like companies that grow organically mm. that they don't take on debt to grow their business they're able to sort of reinvest which is this montgomery approach of can they reinvest their profits and get a better return on that than what I could get by sticking it in a bank or a, or a term deposit or something like that? Um, and so the, the metrics are net debt to equity less than negative 
and earnings per share growth greater than 20%. And the reason for those figures was that it came up more or less with bundles of stocks in that 10 to 20 yeah. range. It, it didn't end up with too few because if you end up with, say, three or four and one of them turns out to be an absolute dudder and the other three go okay but, you know, only make, say, 10 or 20% return, then you're going to be going backwards. Yeah. But you don't want to have 40 or 50. Yeah. So, so that was sort of like, you know, just messing around, trying different settings, you know, how many stocks come up and what sort of returns do I get? So I've been able to back test it back to 2016. Once you go back further than that, uh, it's pretty hard to get hold of enough data, data. Uh, that I can can be confident is going to be accurate. Yeah, yeah. really interesting here. And I think um, important is that you combine those two ideas, because if you would just look for a net debt to equity, you probably would end up with a lot of companies that are really young and that just got a lot of cash because they are just people who want to pour money into those companies yeah. because they, they might end up uh, with, with a good product, um, but they don't really produce something yet. But if you combine that with that, that earnings component, it actually shows companies that, that already have earnings and that are able to actually increase those earnings year by year right so i think that's really interesting that you combine those and and yeah you might up end up with it with a couple of really interesting companies yeah I, i think so i mean look there are literally hundreds and hundreds probably over a thousand stocks on the asx uh that are as you described they've got heaps of cash they've got no debt uh but they're in that early stage they've got a, a product they're developing or a service that they're trying to get going um, and banks aren't willing to lend them money. Uh, so, so they've only got one choice, and that's to do an IPO and get people to uh, subscribe to their IPO and then have capital raisings along the way to keep the company going. Yeah. And there'd be a lot of biotech companies in that space uh, that would be like that. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, There, I think there just has to be more than just saying, oh, they got lots of cash and no debt, so therefore they're a good company. No, 100%. Um, Full, no, fully, but, fully agree. But I, I do like looking for companies that don't make a profit um, but are growing their revenue at a very, very high rate. Um, and then I have a look at their story, if you like. What do they mm. do? And do I understand what they do? And at the moment, probably my best performer in that space, and I've only got like two or three of them, is a points bet because I've been a bit of a – I'm not a gambler. gambler. It's, I just enjoy the challenge of trying to analyse things like uh, horse racing or harness racing and, and times and barriers and jockeys. And, and you know, I've had, I had a go at being a professional investor, uh, probably a, a professional punter. Uh, and I did make some money, but wow, I think I was earning about $2 an hour. And eventually we, <laughs> we said, well, I'm not good enough at this. So I gave that away. But so I've sort of, I understand that, that space and um, points better are, are opening up in the, the US because the US is this Changed growth down. market with, with, with states finally deciding to allow online sports betting. Hmm. Um, I've, I've made the call that I think they have the expertise, uh, the platform uh, and the chance to become a, well, not the dominant player, but certainly a, a, a one of the bigger players in America. Oh. And so, you know, I've invested in that, but banks don't lend them money. They've had, you know, significant capital raisings. Yeah. So they've got no debt, lots of cash, but lots of growing revenue as, uh, as they go for a land grab of clients. Uh, but, of course, they're expending awesomely large amounts of money on advertising um, and and getting that client base. So they're probably still a couple of years away from being profitable. But yeah. uh, most of my companies, though, I want them to be profitable and uh, and growing those earnings as well. Yeah. Awesome. And I think you, you made a couple of hints already to my, my last questions. You talked about uh, investing in the ASX. Uh, so the Australian uh, security yeah. exchange. And now you talked about companies that are going overseas into US. So I, I also would be interesting. So the, it looks like you're mainly investing into Australian companies. And I think 
if I remember correctly, you have a little bit exposure to the US with an ETF. Um, so, so what is your decision to in invest mainly in Australia versus internationally? And do you think, do you want to change that? Uh, is that, so how do you think about the different markets? Yeah, look, I, I've been uh, an ASX investor 100% probably all the way along, mm. uh, even though some of our companies like earn most of their money overseas. So Commonwealth Serum Laboratory, Cochlear, Fisher and Paykel and the healthcare sector. But, but you know, most of their earnings are overseas. Um, unlike, say, uh, ASX, uh, <laughs> all of its money is earned in Australia because they <laughs> they run the ASX. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, part of the benefit, I think, of, of watching lots of YouTube channels and, and so on, to see the number of people who are investing in companies uh, in Europe or mainly America really probably is what I'm, uh, I'm seeing. And, uh, and it's always been difficult to get access to buying stocks listed overseas for me uh, because the brokerage rates were so high and... And the other thing was that I, I just couldn't get hold of easily accessible data that I could use uh, to make a decision about whether I wanted to be invested in them or not. Mm. Um, so, you know, because Stock Doctor is just such a, a thorough platform, there's nothing like it that I could find that, you know, I, that I didn't have to pay a lot of money to actually access the data. So... I then just eventually decided, look, companies like Facebook and Alphabet and uh, and the like, Alibaba, all of these things seem to be just like, they're unstoppable, really, I think. Hmm. They've become so big, you know, this is the old too big to fail. And, you know, right now in Australia, we've got the government taking on Google, trying to stop them from displaying news content without paying for it and... Uh, And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know where this is going to go, but, uh, you know, will we all be using Bing rather than Google? Uh, Very likely not, hey. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that the government and Google will eventually uh, come to some sort of an agreement, but it won't be to Google's disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, getting off track there, back to... <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I've invested in Fang, which, uh, you know, is the... Uh, 10 stocks, including Tesla, um, and I still don't understand why they're so expensive, but anyway, um, I, yeah, and I'm now looking at including things like ARK, um, and, you know, Kathy Wood's ARK Invest, um, an, EF, an, an ETF called ESPO, Sticker Code, which is in the e-gaming space, mm -hmm. and, you know, and this is sort of something based on Uh, in the case of Kathy Wood, I'm putting her in the same category as Elon Musk, um, Steve Jobs when he was alive. Now, you know, some, they, they, they just have that, that vision, I guess. Uh, they, they see what the, the future path of where things are going. Uh, I don't see it. I'm, you know, I'm just not that clever. Um, but I'm willing to put a little bit of my money with behind her and her team. Uh, as far as the ESPO is concerned, I've got a nephew who's fully into gaming um, and you know, he has to have the latest computer with the latest graphics um, facilities or what do you call it, power, um, to be able to run these things. And, and I do know, like, um, I know people who use CAD, AutoCAD, and they, they require very powerful um computing yeah, so cards, compute power, no? yeah so you got you know nvidia and uh, you know all the all the, the all the companies involved in the computing space are going to benefit from this growth in in gaming and you know there are other side type not side but other industries that require high powered computing and so you know that that etf for that reason it's just you know i believe in the story i've got no idea about the fundamentals or the financials of the companies in it um, but I'll, I'll invest in that. Um, I'm going to invest probably in a, an ETF called HACK, H-A-C-K, because uh, I'm getting so many attacks on my computer with people trying to 
into infiltrate my emails and and my texts and God knows what else. And I'm going, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's some pretty uh, unsavoury uh, characters out there trying to do the wrong thing. And so companies and governments are just going to have to make sure that their securities are absolutely uh, swish. Yeah. And so, you know, cyber security should be uh, a good place to be. So investing in the story. And of course, Australia doesn't have many companies in, in those spaces. So yeah. I'll be moving overseas with ETFs. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and probably last to say, because we, we talked a, a, about a couple of individual companies, obviously here is no financial advice on this channel. Um, just sharing <laughs> yeah. our, our ideas, our thoughts. Um, and uh, But yeah, really, really interesting to hear, John. Uh, thanks for sharing your stories on my channel. Um, and yeah, um, who hasn't seen John's channel as yet, go over and have a look, subscribe to his channel. And we're going to have uh, a video on his channel as well, where he will interview me. So we're going to see how that will, will turn out. Uh, John, thanks again for coming along. And oh, uh, look, yeah, it's been very nice talking to you, Michael. And, uh, you know, we do chat regularly and uh, uh, very happy to be on your channel. And hopefully we can uh, see your channel grow. I do like uh, the commentary that you give. And uh, yeah, you're in a sort of investing in companies that I've never heard of. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to our chat and uh, uh, yeah, we'll put that up on my channel and, and hopefully we can share ideas again on a regular basis. That'll be awesome. Perfect. Thanks very much, John. See you then. Okay. Yeah. Bye.